Welcome back, it's the news up, and we are still discussing Kogi and Bayesa election, the aftermath. What are the lessons that have been learned? What played out? What are the things, not just for the uh, electorate, what about the security agencies, what about the electoral empire, INEC, and also the political parties? Any lessons learned? We have in our studio, our legal studio precisely, Bartlemeu. Agwebodo is a legal practitioner, a political analyst, and call him a social commentator. You won't be wrong. Good morning. Good morning. And good to have you. My pleasure. You're welcome. Yeah, there were a lot of pontification before the, the election. People were saying, forget it, Bayasa is a no-no for APC. Some people say, you know, Yabelo underperformed and therefore he's going to be kicked out. Well, it seems um, the bookmakers were proved wrong, or you were one of the bookmakers who predicted right. <laughs> well, the outcome of the Kogi election and that of the Bayasa was something one predicted was going to happen. As long as we don't have proper uh, electoral reforms, election outcome will, be, will always be predicted and decided long before the election itself takes place. Hmm. If you look at the competitions in um, Kogi, for instance, my landed friend, Okutepa SAN, had always been crying out that the electoral process in Kogi, if it is what it is, that justice will not be done. And his fears came to light on Saturday. The issue of the federal might coming in, they, it was obvious that the will of the people never prevailed in, in Kogi. But again, how would the will of the people prevail in an election pro process? where from the very, very beginning, the umpire in the election already had left many gaping holes. I raised some, this same issue sometime last, earlier this year, that until we have an independent electoral body, strictly speaking, election results will always be predetermined because he who pays the piper dictates the tone. If you appoint an electoral umpire's chairman, who is your kinsman, it only follows that he will do your bidding. But he has to be someone's kinsman. Whether it's your kinsman or not isn't the issue. The issue is that we, we do not, we haven't strengthened our political So that's why I wanted to avoid the word kinsman because it's about who is credible, who, is, uh, who got it on marriage. No, the issue of the kinsman comes into play. When Jonathan was the president of this country prior to 2015, if he had removed Jega, from office then. Probably people will have seen it in a different light. But I'm not even concerned about who actually takes the position. My own is that let the institution be strengthened in a way that it is devoid of control by any of the executive uh, go, uh, the arms of um, government. We don't have that situation today. What we have today in Nigeria is that the electoral institutions, both the security agents, are all taking directives from the man at the top. You, you talk of federal might, and I would like to ask you, if the reverse were the case, mm -hmm. if PDP was in power at the federal level, uh, would you also say similar things? Because we've seen elections happen over the years, and then people accused the then ruling party of the same, using the same federal might to refer to. But like I said, from whatever angle you look at it, until we have strengthened institutions, this will be a recurrent decimal. Every man who is appointed by a government, take it or leave it, wants to play to the bidding of the man who appointed you. Because you know one thing for certain, that office you occupy is not secured. It's, there's no security of office. You stay in that office at the whims and caprices of the man at the head. So if prior to 19, 2015, when PDP was holding sway in government, the APC in the position was crying foul then. We remember the equity election there, where soldiers were move, moved in in an ordinary state gubernatorial um, election. So it is still a replica of the man who controls the apparatus of state, dictates the outcome of an election because the institutions itself are not strengthened. Mr. Bart, yes. I, I may be confused, uh, at least I know a bit of uh, recent history, even if I don't know 20, 30 years backwards. Yes. Jonathan, when he was the president, appointed Jega, right? Yes. 
And Jonathan won the election in 2011, yes. right? And against the same man, Buhari, Jonathan won. And the same Jega conducted another election and the opponent won. Yes. So where is this issue of Kingsman, like you, 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 you alluded to, coming? And is it not a case of overwhelming defeat? This is about three million difference. At I least in 2011, there were about three million difference from Jonathan. And what is wrong with incumbent losing, talking about federal might? At least the president in power holds the federal might. So that's where I am confused. Don't get it mixed up. It, prior to the 2015 election, I had opportunity to be on the program like this, and we, we did the presentation very, very clearly. That although the president was on the PDP, the security apparatus were not pro-PDP. The security apparatus were pro-APC. What about 2011? In 2011, PDP was in power. The entire state apparatus were pro-PDP. So they missed it. That's what I'm saying. They then, gave it to the opposition. Then secondly, in 2015, the president, Jonathan Asidem, was, was playing the role of an elder statesman. In 2015. I want to leave a legacy. I want to be remembered for something. I remembered on one of your programs I did say that if you look at the president Jonathan left, President Jonathan left over the election, he will go down the history in Nigeria as the first sitting president who called on the day of an election result to congratulate his opponent, saying no seat of power is what human blood. blood. All right. So let's that is his own personal opinion. That is, and that is the legacy today he rides on. If he doesn't have that disposition and didn't do what he did on that very day, of course you agree with me that will have been bloodbath once Buhari is declared the winner. Because we all knew that in 2015 the polity was heated to the point of explosion. That if the president had said, no, this is not acceptable to me, maybe we wouldn't have had in the country called Nigeria today. Beautiful. All right, so let's, let's come back to the Bayosa and Kogi reality yes. post-election. Would you say that uh, the election in both states would prove uh, just how precarious uh, the situation has become, knowing that over 60,000 policemen were deployed to both states and uh, we still had high record of violence? I do not see anything abnormal in, from what we expected in Kogi and Bayelsa. In the last five years, all elections conducted in this country had had similar stories. And if we will recall, prior to the 2019 general election, there was this clamor we had for the issue of deferring clear court boundaries between police rule in election and the use of the armed forces in election. But the truth remains, if we look at it objectively and holistically there, there is no way we will get a different result in Kogi where an underperforming government is not looking at the masses, is not looking at what the wills and wishes of the people is. The interest is, I want to remain in power, no matter whose ass is God. If you remember the joke President Jonathan made in 2015, where the then sitting president was called the clueless president, he made a clue that if a man fails a class, is he not meant to repeat the class? And Nigerians reacted that if a man fails the class in the political field, there is no room for repetition of that same class. But we all witnessed prior to the Kogi election on Saturday, where sitting governors who were underperforming were coming to make a show of shame on the, on the political stage that the people of Kogi should forgive a governor who spent four years without achieving anything. The desperation of the APC government becomes very, very clear. That is, the question is, we do not care what the aspiration of the public or the people are. We want power because Mr. we want to prevent control. Mr. Bath, yes. uh, uh, let's, let's, let's look before Yaya Bilo. Uh, yes. The Yaya Bilo camp reminded us that um, the salary being owed were inherited. They reminded us that when he came in, just like many other states, the issue of uh, downturn in the economy was prominent and it was difficult for anybody to pay salary. They had to re 
you know, rely on federal government for bailout. Now, for, 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 for Yahya Bilu, he wants to remind us that um, this is not peculiar to Kogi State. And we also saw ethnic politics playing up, where both ethnic and partisan, you know, PDP has been in, uh, or, or let me say, uh, AMPP, the times of Aldo Babubaka, then we have PDP. This is the first time, let's say, APC got into power through um, the death of Aldo Abubakar. Mm -hmm. And now, what is wrong with another tribe having a taste of the power? And what is wrong if the people overwhelmingly vote for me? Why do you have to attribute it to um, underperformance, you know, put in the, uh, uh, push it too far? I think we are getting things mixed up. My position in, in Kogi election is from this very direction. If a government is underperforming and the people still want him, the democratic process, if it is threatened, returns the man. They said every society deserves the leader. It has. It has. But the point of concern is where the wills of the, of the people are subverted, where people come out to vote and you are scaring voters with military men shooting sporadically. Life does not have a duplicate copy. That's only one original. We had a replay of it in Nokota during the Lagos gubernatorial election. After the election went against APC the first time, and some elections were rescheduled, then the second election coming up, the upper Saturday, there were threatened violence. Most people who will come out to vote sat back at home. These politicians are not worth dying for. Four. I won't waste my life there. Wouldn't you have subverted the will of the people if at the end of the day those who turned out to vote were those who voted the unpopular or underperforming governor? So the question is not a, a question of, oh, votes have been cast. And if an underperforming governor is returned, regardless of which tribe it comes from, that is the will of the people. My own position is clearly stated here that allow the free will of people to be exercised. Strengthen your political institutions to do what is right, regardless who becomes a beneficiary of the outcome. And we'll all be better off for it tomorrow. If I vote a wrong person into power, I can gladly take the outcome. The outcome. In 2015, I was among, among, among those who were clamoring for the return of um, Buhari, the change mantra. In fact, I created a lot of political enemies, both within lawyers and outside the lawyers' rank. I was one of those who said Jonathan was clueless because we didn't see what he did in the last six years or thereabout. When the heat of the change mantra started playing out, nine months there was no appointment of cabinet. I was the first to the camp, but I admitted. <laughs> yes, I came out publicly on Facebook to apologize that, oh, I contributed my own quota to bring in, bring in the government, but I think I disappointed myself because what I felt was, wasn't what okay. I saw. But at least, I was able to exercise my will. And that was one of the issues the Nathan reminded us that not long after he would leave office, Nigeria would realize that the freedom we enjoyed, which was grossly abused then, would no longer be available for us to enjoy. And that's what's playing out today. Okay. Because Jonathan lost the election in 2015 because he allowed the institutions to play their independent role. All right, but let's, let's narrow down this conversation to the Bios and Kogi elections. Yes. Uh, we know it could be intertwined with the presidential election yes. or elections of the past. Well, let's bring it back to the reality of post-elections on Saturday. Now, we're looking at the key players, INEC, the electorate politicians, and all those who had a major role to play in the elections. INEC, on one hand, has been beaten by uh, certain individuals saying that they didn't perform well. Well, they think they performed well. But for you, would you say, despite the violence, despite the vote buying recorded, that INEC did, uh, was, performed averagely well? I always call INEC low in the last five years, and that hasn't changed. From the reports we had, for instance, in the Bayesa election in Southern Ijo, some NGOs reported that 28 polling stations did not open for voting at all. Yet INEC announced results in those areas. If I must call INEC high, where will I get my the criteria for such scores? Because naturally, if election was not conducted in certain police stations, an independent arbiter would definitely report back, or 
we were not able to get voting materials to A, B, C, D, E, F police stations because of security challenges. They were the ones we conducted, these are the results. Whether the one you recorded <coughs> is manipulated or not remains to be seen. But my worry is, in those clear pulling boots where observers said the police stations didn't open at all for voting. In other words, no INEC material got there, no INEC staff got there, voters did not register. How come in your result you are allocating or announcing results there? I think the appropriate thing INEC will have done when they got this report will have been to be able to get an, a, a very good score, will have been to have an internal audit to actually find out if these elections took place there or hmm. not. And again, I have pointed out in the time pass, and I'll repeat it again on air this morning, that INEC, aside waiting for observers to make opinions about what their election is, should have an internal mechanism. We're in an IT world these days where they can easily check what is happening in each zone while the election is going okay. on. Okay. Uh, but let's yeah. look at um, Yaga. Yaga, to a large extent, over time has been giving a lot of kudos with their with their internal mechanism to check what INEC is doing because they have a way of also assessing the poll. In fact, the United States and EU adopted their report over the last election and they expressed their reservation and when it has to be commended. Now, Yaga has called for the cancellation of Kogi election. That's both governorship and that of the senatorial. Mm -hmm. But in times of, I mean, when it comes to Bayelsa, that's why I'm trying to check that report, whether it's not one of the uh, uh, observer group that is not credible. But there seems to be a kind of acceptance with what happened in Bayelsa. Uh, you know that uh, it is no longer news that Jonathan was not supporting the PDP candidate. It's alleged, at least. Alleged. If we are not sure of the pre I mean, the former president, we are sure of his wife. We are sure of all the stories we hear about PDP defeated itself. Will you still say that INEC has any issue with Bayelsa? Because on the day of election, there was hardly any record of violence. But in the build up, there <coughs> was violence anyway. Bayelsa. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be speaking out of Bayelsa. Like when I mentioned Santa Angel, I do not have an, an issue as to the acceptability of the results. My, my quarrel with the Bayelsa outcome. outcome is having results in polling stations where election did not hold. Of course, PDP has an internal problem. And as is always the case in a political climate in Nigeria, once an, a party is having an internal issue on candidacy, there will always be a protest vote swinging to the other party, play that in Bayelsa. But even at that, there are still areas where it is suspected that INEC still did not do its work the way it ought to be done. Done. What, we all were part of the 2000, um, immediate past um, election, election. general election. There are some areas <coughs> where you will say, oh, the people accepted the result as okay. That the people accepted the result doesn't mean that the election was conducted free and, free fair. and fair. But the thing is that between the devil and the DBC. Some will say choose none. Choose none. Why <laughs> some will say choose one? That is exactly what is playing out there. Hmm. The, I know this devil, I don't know the angel. So if I know the devil with all its malfunctioning, I may decide to go for the devil and leave the angel, I don't. No. no. So accepting the result is one thing. The result of being credible is a different ballgame. Why some accepted the result in Bayelsa? Because they saw it as, oh, it's good payback time for... But I think the statistics are clear. The two out of eight local governments, the two states won by PDP, belong to the governor and the candidate. <coughs> the other six, you know this comment that was credited to the governor, saying some are not non core is job. <coughs> so I think those are clear issues. So that's why I said there that the internal problem they had Play will raise the issue of acceptability. If Bayelsa is a core PDP state from 1999 till date, and all of a sudden you started playing the exclusion policy, these people are not called Ijo, these are called Ijo. You sow the seed that consumed you. Whatever irregularities that come out there, people will applaud it. It is good way back time for you. Thank God it ended the way it ended for you. We are not concerned from my own point of view on, oh, how acceptable is this result? We are looking at how strengthened are the political institutions for tomorrow. Okay. Now, talking about um, the February-March elections of this year, 
uh, Nigerians were expecting a better election uh, on Saturday uh, between uh, in Kogi and the Bayelsa states. Now, would you say that um, INEC performed better or the electorates? You know, before the elections in February, we even had a, a, a jingle, you know, asking Nigerians uh, not to involve in violence and to adhere strictly to the INEC rules of not taking your phones to the polling unit and all of that. Would you say that, because I'm really wondering how we can move ahead in the next election. Whether it's to trade blames now is, is a question that I, I'm yet to get the answers from. Would you say INEC or the electorate or the politicians? Because what we saw now, what we saw on Saturday, uh, we saw youths being violent, people shooting. Uh, we saw them snatching ballot boxes. How do you think we can even grow from here? When we, when we talk about 2023, do you think lessons were learned in February, March? Do you think from what we've seen just this Saturday that we could see an improvement in the next elections? I, to be very, very, very sincere with you, I don't think I'll be optimistic to expect anything better in 2023. Hmm. One, there ought to be a mass orientation, reorientation of the populace. In the first place, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. A man who has been unemployed for three years, who has no food on his table, who has no hope of tomorrow, election is coming up on Saturday, and you are giving me 100,000 naira to ensure that nobody votes your opponent. The temptation is that he will succumb to the 100,000 naira I'm looking at tomorrow. So if we must have a go at a better election, the first part is there ought to be a mass reorientation that election is not all about what you get in your pocket But now. who will do that orientation? Is it INEC or N uh, NOA or who exactly should do this reorientation? INEC has a part to play in it. Our Ministry of Information too has a part to play. That's why I said that the desperation of politicians who are the active actors on the stage is even complicating issues the more because elections in Nigeria are now seen as a do or die thing. And you won't blame them. If a man spent 80 million naira to take a nomination form and has spent 500 million naira prior to his campaign for the election, it becomes an investment that you cannot expect him to fold his hands and watch go down the drain. A man who has spent 800 million naira contesting for senatorial seat and knows that the opponent is likely going to raise hell on election day, will invest into violence. So one, the leadership of the political parties has a role to play. This role will be a question of calling their spade their spade. If a candidate is, or if, if, if an elected office holder and aspirant is not somebody who is credible, the issue of it comes from my party or it doesn't come from my party does not play out. If you look at what happens within the other climbs, the developed climbs, there are times voting at the various houses goes beyond party lines. Somebody tells you, I'm a Republican. The president is switching an impeachment proceeding. I can't vote for his remaining in office because I'm a Republican. I have a duty to protect my constituency because somebody is going to ask me questions tomorrow. Until we get to that point where those institutions are strengthened that very way, then the political class will always be a problem to aid violence. Because somebody pays for these talks. Mm. Now, the federal government will also have to restrain itself from getting involved in state elections. We had the president, as is reported, approved the bill out of 10 billion naira in Kogi State for assumingly paying all backlogs of salary. Roads, no, roads constructed. Now the question we have to ask is, where did the president get the approval for 10 billion to Kogi? Was that money in the appropriation bill? Did it go through the appropriation process? Because we do not have strengthened political institutions, nobody's asking. That's actually debatable because the president forwarded it to the Senate and the Senate approved it, but the timing of the approval was what was debatable. That why should it be two days to the election? And they reminded the opposition that, excuse me, other states that fix the federal rules have gotten their reform. So why should you deny Kogi State? And for the opposition, why don't you wait after the election? 
Now, I'm not even looking at what the money was meant for. The area I'm emphasizing is, appropriated. is if the appropriation is made, the question is what and what roads in Kogi were fixed for which this appropriation was made. When two sitting, three sitting governors come for campaign for a gubernatorial candidate, who the people believe isn't doing well, and the government is throwing its backing behind it. It creates a disconnect between the people and the government at the center that our feelings, our pains are not being felt by those at the center. And once Mr. this Bert, trust issue... Mr. Bart, yes. since you are facing the political class, yes. let's, let's do it holistically now. Okay. Because all the things you're seeing APC do, we saw it in PDP. We saw the president move to the state when we are having staggered elections. Yes. We saw the, the state paraphernalia, the security agencies being deployed to those states when we are having elections. Yes. So let's look at the political class generally. I am not saying that APC here. Like when I was responding okay. to her issue, I said the political class yeah. and the actors will have to see election not as a do or, or die. die affair. Then how do we make it unattractive to them? Good. In, until Nigeria gets to the point where political offices like the Senate and co are not full time, until we get to the point where we don't we no longer monetize political processes. For instance, now, if there is a gubernatorial election, as we have in Kogi and Bayelsa, nobody is monitoring how much the political party created in from donations. Nobody is monitoring how much was spent in that. Nobody is monitoring who got what and how what was. Got now, if we look at the case of um, Ezekwesi, who ran for the presidency, the party alleged you use your candidates to raise funds from okay. international donors for yourself. And the last minute you check in, out. You must come and render account. Okay. Until we get to the point where we demonetize the political process, it will remain attractive. Uh, one, one commentator was saying about um, the past... Um, as governor of um, Edo State, he was a labor leader who we all know how he came about. He got into government for eight years. After becoming governor, he's a multi billionaire holding estates here and there. In advanced climes, somebody will ask questions. All right. But because in Nigeria here, whatever comes goes the way it comes. It becomes attractive that although I do not have the wherewithal, once I get into that power, I become rich overnight. Okay. In that case, you must do everything practically possible to get there. All right. So when we, we'll take a break at this point. When we come back, we shall be talking about post-election. Uh, PDP, as we know, has um, refused to sign the paper saying that um, it rejects the outcome of the Kogi election. Uh, we'll discuss that right after this break. Here.